The best aspect of Cold War Zombies is the fact that we can actually see how much damage we are dealing to zombies specifically now. As a result, that is where this whole project ended up sparking and starting from, so that way we could try to figure out which guns are actually the best in terms of damage for zombies. This project started about two months ago, and at the time of recording this, is going live right before Season 2 starts. As new things are getting added into Cold War Zombies, obviously these numbers are going to change, and this is going to be a project that I'm going to be keeping up to date as fast and as often as possible throughout the entire year. If you are someone that just wants to see the numbers yourself and don't care about anything that I'm saying, which is respectable, there are links to the spreadsheets down below that are labeled by what season the numbers are recorded through so you can keep track and do all the math yourself if choose to be. One thing I would like to ask though, is that if you take any images of the spreadsheets or anything throughout the video or anything, please just mention that I did it. Reddit.com at least has a 50% rate of acknowledging back during the XP video that we made that the stuff came from me. But at the same time, YouTubers with almost 5 million subs can't credit me at all and just say it came from Reddit instead. So please, please, please just mention that it at least was done by me if you go spreading any of this information anywhere. The way the spreadsheet itself is set up is as follows. If you're looking at the sheet itself, in the bottom left, you'll see five lines. If you click that, it will show you every single tab that you're able to view and sort yourself. Each tab will start off with the season or the time era to which all of those numbers were collected through. Each time arrow should have three different tabs themselves. There's the number comparison sheet, which shows different formulaic values and some straight hard values that you can sort by columns, either from Z to A to get the highest numbers up top, or A to Z to get the lowest numbers up top. The other two tabs for weapon numbers are strictly for holding different damage values for each type of weapon, whether it be a regular weapon or a wonder weapon. Within each of the tabs, I have tried to include as many notes as I possibly can. To look at the notes, simply hover over any of the squares that have a little black carrot in the top right corner, and then you'll see the notes. And you may need to drag and expand it to read the notes better. Before we actually get into the specific numbers themselves, there are some other things that we need to set first and make very clear. First off is there is a very possible likelihood that I might have made a mistake somewhere in a formula or wrote down a wrong number. This is why I'm providing all the extra information to you all. So if I did make a mistake, you all, if you're interested enough, can double check it, let me know, and then I can go back and correct it. Secondly, we want to point out that for the comparison of these numbers, every number that is taken is from that weapon's most ideal, highest possible DPS perspective. What this means is every gun's damage value was recorded at a point blank range, so that way damage fall off is completely removed from the equation. But also, every gun is at its max upgraded version. For regular weapons, that is legendary pack-a-punch times three, and then for wonder weapons, it varies depending on the wonder weapon itself. Another important thing to note about all this is that all these damage numbers were recorded with the perks, the field upgrades, the weapon classes, with everything unlocked possible at the time that those specific damage numbers were recorded. In regards to Deadshot specifically, those numbers are not including Deadshot's extra bonus percent damage at all. On the comparison page, there are columns specifically for Deadshot, but on the weapon numbers pages specifically, they are not included whatsoever. Now, I'm sure there's probably something that I forgot to mention just to try to help things be as clear as possible from the get-go. So if there's anything that is a bit confusing or whatnot, please feel free to leave a comment down below and I will do my best to try to get to them all and try and help out and try to make things as clear as possible. Because as much as these damage numbers are for me to use, they are just as much for everybody else to use. So I want you all to be able to understand them as well. With all of that out of the way now, let's go ahead and get started by talking about pack-a-punching and rarity upgrades 
and what is the most ideal order to do them in. On the screen right now, you're going to be seeing a box with a bunch of different colors and a bunch of different numbers. What this box represents is the melee weapon class. So like Wakazashi, the sledgehammer, the combat knife, that stuff. They all deal the exact same base damage value. What this box helps show us is how the actual multiplication works based on different combinations, well, every combination of every Pack-A-Punch and every rarity form. So a rough TLDR, for those that might be a little lazy, we can see that for Pack-A-Punch, tier one is a times two bonus, tier two Pack-A-Punch is a times four bonus, and tier three Pack-A-Punch is a times eight bonus. Green rarity is a 1.5 times damage bonus, blue rarity is a two times damage bonus, purple is a three times damage bonus, and legendary or an orange is a four times damage bonus. Ultimately, if you have a max upgraded weapon, your weapon is now dealing 32 times more damage than if it was never upgraded at all. Now, I do need to take a second here and talk about something because there are issues with this multiplication system. Looking at the box that has the melee numbers in it again, you can see that all of the numbers are very clean, exact multiplications of everything. And this holds true for wonder weapons, launchers, explosives, like I said, the melee weapons, and the Pellington Sniper. However, every other single weapon in this game never actually has a clean multiplication table as follows. And I will use the XM4 here just as a quick example of showing how off it can be. Now, there are a couple potential reasons for this. One, the numbers that we see on screen don't show us decimal values. They just get truncated off. And as a result, that could throw off percentages here and there. However, that doesn't explain some of the massive disparities between some of the multiplication factors. So the second option, and this is what I just believe at this point, is game broke. <laughs> Getting back on track, however, now that we know all the different multiplication factors and everything, in terms of how much currency you have at a certain point, whether it be salvage or points, and the current methods of us gaining salvage through attachments, double points, whatever means necessary, the preferred or the optimal upgrade tree is as follows. If you start a gun at its base rarity, you want to alternate choosing rarity and then pack a punch, rarity and then pack a punch. And if you follow this method, typically by around round 25, you will have enough salvage and points to have the gun fully max upgraded. One last quick thing to touch on before we actually start looking into each individual weapon class are the two categories that we're going to primarily be looking at and comparing. Firstly, we're going to be looking at single shot damage. And by definition, I mean, to be fair, this is pretty simple, but what we're doing this as is whenever one ammo comes off of the ammo counter, that is what the single shot damage is. There are some exceptions to this, like the alternate form of the Reike. This specific category is good to look at because it helps you show low damage times that you would have, right? If you only have time to shoot one or two bullets off, what gun is going to probably end up being the best for you to use in that situation? But on the other hand, to where if you have an extended amount of time, what you want to be technically be comparing are DPS values. For those who don't know, DPS stands for damage per second, and there are a multitude of ways to where you can calculate this number. There are two that we're going to be focusing on. One is the DPS based off the rounds per minute value, and then we're also going to be doing a category called true DPS. DPS based off the RPM is a scenario to where if you could shoot infinitely, or basically if you're in a ring of fire to where you never have to reload. This, while it is an accurate number, it's not really a realistic number because you're not taking into it the you're not taking into account the reload factor, which is something that is very necessary and is going to affect the guns 90% of the time. 
The last big thing in regards to all of these categories is we're going to be specifically looking at the critical or headshot values as opposed to the body shot values because the critical shot values are what give us the highest potential damage possible and that's what we want to look at. So let's finally get into all the damage comparisons, starting with the assault rifles. Now, all the numbers are on the screen, so I'm not going to read everything out specifically to you. And I have all the attachments listed down below, and that is basically how they work for all weapon classes. But just so you know that they're there and everything. The big things to take away from the assault rifle numbers is that the Groza is king at the moment. It's not like it's a very like big difference or anything, but... You look across the three tables in general, and the Groza sits at the top for basically all of them. Another thing to note as well with assault rifles is, while Deadshot Daiquiri will help you, it's not going to make a monumental difference anywhere within this weapon class at its current tier 3 abilities. Next up, we have the submachine guns, and this is where we have our first examples as to why we want to look at damage numbers from multiple categories. You can see based off of the per bullet damage, the KSP with attachments is by far the highest ever. But when you look at true DPS time, the MAC-10 then completely takes over. And if we're talking about using an SMG in a realistic setting, the single shot damage comparison here, while it is unique and interesting to see, is not realistic. And especially in this case, true DPS is what matters the most for SMGs. So by far, I would recommend the MAC-10. Once again, just like the assault rifles, Deadshot Daiquiri is not going to be seeing the most benefit at all from extra damage in this weapon class either. Let's now take a look at the tactical rifles. Now, there's not really going to be any big surprises here because just from playing the game, you know which tactical rifle is by far the best. So moving past admitting the M16 is completely stronger than the rest, we need to then look at the difference between the two barrels, and this applies to all tactical rifles, which is the task force and the strike team. Ultimately, it just comes to personal preference for what you need, but for the strike team, it gives you less range but faster fire rate, while the task force barrel will give you farther range but slower fire rate than if you had strike team on. In regards to Deadshot Daiquiri for this weapon class, it is by far the first class where you're going to see a noticeable improvement if you use it versus if you don't. But just to know, on all burst weapons in the game, only the very first bullet of the burst weapon gets the Deadshot bonus. Next up we got the big boys with the LMGs coming in. Sorry for saying it like that. But um, yeah, so... Not really, I don't think anything too surprising out of this. Once again, another example to where the single shot damage doesn't always correlate over the, to a true DPS value. However, just once again, the LMG that has felt the best in game ends up being at the top of the DPS value charts. Now, just like the tactical rifles, you do have a choice of barrels here. Task Force prefers the same damage bonus with range, while Division gives you damage bonus, but movement speed. And with LMGs, they can be a bit chunky boys, so that movement speed can be nice, but it is just personal choice. In this weapon class, Deadshot Daiquiri is basically the same as the assault rifles or SMGs. Like, you'll notice a difference from using it, but you're not going to see as big as a benefit as if you're using single shot weapons. The next class we're going into is going to be the snipers, and from here on out, we're going to be pulling out the big chair and having some deeper conversations. So when it comes to snipers, the gun by itself is designed to shoot once or twice and then move. That's how the guns have always, in real life, in video games, performed, right? So, for snipers, you should really be looking at the single shot category for which gun will perform the best. However, in video games especially, there are times where these guns, you're going to be used in extended damaging situations, and this is where things start to get really confusing. If you go based strictly off the RPM value for DPS, it doesn't make any sense why the Barrett 50 cal is at the top. Yes, it shoots the fastest, but anyone that has used it in-game knows by far that it's just not as great of a weapon to use. So how is it at the top for that? 
This is my biggest, biggest example as to why DPS RPM is not a great realistic scenario category to truly be comparing things off of. That is why the true DPS category makes a lot more sense to most players. Because if you have infinite ammo to shoot, yes, you could understand where the bear at 50 cal could come out of, on top overall. But, especially if you start considering Deadshot Daiquiri into the case, which is by far the best on snipers, the numbers just don't make any sense as to why you would ever want to choose a 50 cal over the Tundra or the Pellington, period. Now, taking a look at the attachments for snipers for a second, the way that I currently have it set up, which is for the most part, the top row of the attachments list is to maximize as much salvage, ADS, all of that stuff as you can possibly go. But if you are looking for better ADS times, I definitely recommend, especially on the muzzle, doing flash hider or even the suppressor if it doesn't feel weird to you over the task force shroud. And as well, on top of that, underneath the body category, you can put the spotlight attachment on over the ember attachment. Now we get going into the pistols. And just to start off with pistols, let's get the akimbo attachments out of the way. Akimbo attachments are essentially just going to double the DPS of the gun by itself. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? However, that's also assuming you can have perfect accuracy with two hip fired pistols. So theoretically, yes, they're always going to be at the top of the boards here, but in a realistic manner, never really going to recommend them. So keeping all this in mind and looking at the list again, you can see the Magnum and the 1911 are pretty on par with each other, with the only advantage being the Magnum having the higher single shot damage. And that would be the one pistol that I would recommend, because especially if you throw Deadshot Daiquiri into the mix, the Magnum is going to severely outclass the 1911. Now comes by far what's going to be the hardest category to specifically discuss, because I first have to teach everybody how shotguns actually work in this game. So first off, shotguns in this game, whenever you shoot a shotgun, it technically shoots eight micro bullets or pellets, however you want to think of it, at the same time. However, not all of those pellets get applied to the zombie or the enemy at the same exact time either. The game will apply the first pellet. The first pellet of a shotgun shot will have more damage than every other pellet in the shotgun shot, period. I don't know why, that's just how it works. If that first pellet is not enough damage to kill the zombie, the game will then apply the next pellet, which is at the regular pellet damage, which is less than the first pellet. And then if that pellet is not enough to kill the zombie, then it applies another pellet and this cycle continues until exactly enough pellets kill the zombie and the zombie is dead. This is why sometimes when using a shotgun, you shoot a zombie and maybe you only get one floating damage number, or sometimes you get three floating damage numbers. Or if they, to make this even more confusing, sometimes you'll get five floating damage numbers, which is actually the limit for the Cold War engine. So sometimes you'll see five floating damage numbers, but you actually had all eight pellets make contact. But because it can only show five floating numbers at the same time, the first three pellets just don't get shown to the player as making contact. And to make this even more confusing on top of everything, the Hauer is always at eight pellets, unpack a punched and pack a punched. But for the Street Sweeper and the Gallo, whenever you pack a punch of those, they go from eight pellets to four pellets. But it's not actually four pellets, it's still technically eight pellets, but each of those four pellets is actually doubled what it would be if there was only eight. And to even throw on top of all of this confusion, remember how I said the very first pellet has in an increased damage amount? That first pellet is the only pellet that will get the dead shot bonus. In your head, you would be thinking all eight pellets shoot at the same time, so technically they all make contact at the same time, so they would all get the dead shot bonus. But no, that is not how it works. Only the very first pellet, which is an increased damage from the rest of the pellets, gets the dead shot bonus. Are you still with me? Because that's all the confusing stuff. Now, we're just gonna look at the numbers. Now, the first thing you're probably thinking is, how the heck is the Howard dealing so much more damage than everything else? I thought the Gallo was the best. Eh, sorry, you all were wrong. 
Now, this doesn't take away from the Gallo, especially the Gallo with attachments. It is still by far one of the best guns in the game and is still incredibly strong. However, the Hauer completely outclasses it on a whole other scale. And yes, just in case you were wondering, that is the Street Sweeper numbers with the improved DPS that it has now. Previously, before they buffed it, it was about 100% less damage. They doubled the damage of the Street Sweeper to even put it to where it is currently. Now, before we get talking about Wonder Weapons and their DPSs, there are two more categories that we need to cover. First, let's look at the melee weapons. Now, the melee weapons aren't really that crazy because they all deal the same damage per hit. The only thing that separates them is the animation swing time, which causes the DPS times to be slightly different. Now, if you ask me, they should have different damage numbers, at least between the Sledgehammer and the Wakazashi and Combat Knife. The Sledgehammer, since it already is slower to swing by, by default, you think would have more damage impact in general, but that's just not how it works. For the launcher category and most explosive weapons, like the ray gun, we had to get creative with, in terms of determining the single shot damage because they don't actually deal crit damage, but we still want to compare it with everything else. So for most explosive weapons, it's split up this way. The body damage is just the damage that is only from the explosive radius, but the crit damage is the impact damage on top of also getting that explosive damage radius. One quick note about the launcher class as well. A lot of people really, really dislike this class because they're using it in the wrong way. These launcher weapons are not designed to go against enemies 1v1. They are designed to take out groups and hordes of enemy at the same time. So while they are bad at 1v1 damage, if you use it in the correct method at multiple enemies at the same time, these weapons really shine and you can get a better light for them. We finally get to talk about the wonder weapons now. And this is probably one of the more unique things we get to do because you don't typically get to compare wonder weapons across different maps. But now that we have damage numbers, we can kind of do it. But again, when it comes to wonder weapons, they're all unique and special in the ways that they work. So this is the best that we could get to where all of their damage values are similar enough to be compared. In fact, when it comes to the Wonder Weapons, I really recommend that you look at the Wonder Weapon sheets on the spreadsheet in general because it goes into a lot more depth about how they all work specifically in regards to their damage numbers. A couple things to note just in case you're confused. For the Red K84 alt mode in the single shot category, that number is determined by the orb explosion, but then also adding in the damage of the tick damage that will occur while you're waiting for the orb itself to explode. For the die gas variant, that damage number is if you shoot out a gas cloud and a zombie were to stand in it for its entire length, that's how much tick damage it should receive. For the dielectric variant, the way this weapon works is for the first second that you hold it down, you get 1,000 damage per tick. During the second second, you get 3,000 damage per tick. And then from the third second onward, as long as you continually hold it down, you get 7,500 damage per tick. For number and comparison testing reasons, that 7,500 is what we are using to compare against everything. For the die ice variant, the tick rate is actually at a rate of 2,000 damage per tick, but you can get two ticks worth of damage per one ammo consumption, so that's why that number is 4,000. For the die fire variant, the way this weapon actually works is the damage scales to what the zombie round health is at the current time, but since zombie health caps at 30,000 on round 43, we put the number 50,000 here because against boss or special zombies, this weapon will deal 50,000 if it can't kill it in one shot. So we can use 50,000 damage here because it will always be technically accurate for zombies unless the health cap changes. And finally for the ray gun, just to make sure that this is clear, it is just like the launcher category comparison. The number for the single shot ray gun is the impact damage added into the explosive radius damage as well. 
Now, before we get to showing the big list and the top 15 weapons for all the weapons thrown together, I figured it would be cool to show you some interesting stats about some guns and then also some map-specific damage numbers on top of that even. So first, some interesting stuff about D-Machine. And first, it's the suck mechanic of the Wonder Weapon. Whenever you are sucking zombies for ammo, you will only target two zombies at a time. The amount of damage that it deals scales based off of per round. And whenever you get a zombie kill, you will get three ammo back no matter what variant you are using. Also, the suck mechanic of the die machine can suck up the radiation spots that megatons throw, and if you kill a dog this way, it will not spawn a gas cloud. The Plague Hound health actually scales based off of dog rounds themselves. Every time you have a dog round, that's what will cause the Plague Hound health to scale. They don't scale off a per round basis, but a per dog round basis. Plague Hounds have a weakness to the fire ammo mod, while Megatons and Bombers have a weakness to the Deadwire ammo mod. Each of those, however, is a 50% damage increase. Insta kills on this map give a two and a half times damage multiplier against Megatons and Bombers. Nukes will do 50% of what the total health for a Megaton and Bomber on that specific round is. The heavy zombie armor on this map will reduce the damage by 75%. Now let's move over to Firebase Z and some interesting map information about it. For the Ray K84, it actually gets an extra 2 times crit multiplier against Mimics specifically. So for regular zombies and manglers and everything, it has 2.5 times crit multiplier. But for Mimics, you can get a times 5 crit multiplier on it. As well, the Red K84 can also receive the Deadshot bonus damage on a fully healthy zombie. For insta-kills on this map, they deal a times 5 extra damage against Manglers and Mimics. Nukes will take out about 75-80% to 80 of the total health of a Mimic or Mangler as well. Mimics have a weakness to Brain Rot, Hellhounds have a weakness to Cryofreeze, and Manglers have a weakness to the Fire Ammo mod. All of these damage increases are by 50%, just like on D-Machine. Manglers reduce damage by 60% on this map, when the armored zombies on this map reduce damage by 50%. Now, it's finally time to go ahead, I mean, unless you've already looked at the spreadsheet, but in terms for the video, it's time to finally show off the top 15 or 20 weapons, I don't remember the exact number, for each of the categories that we've been comparing throughout the entire video. Now, things to note specifically about these comparisons. Obviously, they don't took range into account whatsoever. So just keep that in mind if you're going to be using any of these charts to make a decision about a weapon to use. And just to note, once again, it is very possible that I've made a mistake somewhere. Now, I'm very confident in all of the numbers and everything that I've put together. But do know that human error is a possibility in any of these calculations ever. Now, this is obviously just a small snippet of the entire thing. I highly encourage you to look at the spreadsheet if you are really interested in a lot more numbers. Because on the spreadsheet as well, I even have different categories as to which, which weapon benefits from Deadshot Daiquiri the most. And which weapon benefits from having attachments even on it the most. And there's some even more factors that you could do with all the numbers that are available to you to do on your own even. And this project up to this point has taken about two months. It started around Christmas of 2020. I started it because the numbers really interest me. I mean, I guess, haha, you can make fun of the name. But the numbers were really interesting to me. And I've learned so much about how the game fundamentally even works from doing this project. And as I said at the start of the video, I'm going to do my best to keep up to date with this as new things get added, especially with Season 2 right around the corner and everything getting an extra two skill tiers for perks, weapon classes, field upgrades is going to change these numbers potentially significantly. For this video, however, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Now, the link for the spreadsheet down below is hopefully going to remain the main spreadsheet as weapon and damage updates come out. And it will just be continually added to in the form of new tabs. 
So I hope this video has interested some people, and if you've really enjoyed it, or if you learned anything interesting out of it, I appreciate it, and I just I hope you enjoyed your time watching this decently long video explaining everything to the best of my abilities. So remember to always make the smart decisions. I love y'all, and I'll see you in the next video or stream.